This is the northeast corner of our lot. And this is Buckthorn, my nemesis. When we bought this property, it had been abandoned effectively for 30 or 40 years. And in that time, Buckthorn completely took over this whole portion of the property. We've been battling it ever since, about two years now. And the reason that Buckthorn was able to take over the whole area is because it secretes a chemical called juglone from its roots. This chemical inhibits the growth of other plants and allowed it to become totally dominant. I'm a believer that there's no such thing as a bad plant, but buckthorn really doesn't give us much, not many useful yields, and I'd like to use this area for something else. But as you can see, if I kind of show you here, this is still cropping up everywhere. And realistically, there's still a lot of root mass in the soil and it's still producing juglone. And I need to be realistic about that as I am taking back this part of the property. I am going to build a guild here that is resistant to juglone in order to give it a fighting chance of surviving. And rather than go into the whole theory behind guilds and permaculture forests, because there's a ton of articles and good books about that, I'm just going to build one step by step and show you how I think it through, give you an actionable example, and then hopefully enable you to do the same thing yourself. I'm also going to link in the description below the file that I used for this. It's a plant database with a whole bunch of characteristics in it. Forgive the audio here for a minute. I'm going to do a screen record so you can see how I use my plant database file. It is organized by common name alphabetically of the plant. I've listed the layer that it will take on in a classic permaculture forest system where your tallest will be your overstory trees. Underneath that, you can tuck some understory trees. You can have shrubs beneath, beneath those, herbaceous layer beneath that. So now we're down to like, you know, a couple feet tall. And then at the bottom is a ground cover layer. In a system, you will also have root plants as well as vines. Those are not something I'm gonna be talking about today. For things like shrubs and trees, I've given the height as well as the width or spread of the plant, its light requirements and its hardiness zone, the coldest zone it can survive. So something that says three can go all the way down to zone three. Something that says a six would not, as an example, survive in a zone five. And I'll show you my zone here real quick. We are right on the border of zone five, zone six, and I include things that are zone six in this particular file, but it's kind of dicey for me to use them. Moving on in the file, as I start putting together guilds, I think about benefits and uses, the blue section here. First is, does it produce an edible crop for us or shelter or forage for wildlife, nectar or pollen for beneficial insects? Does it provide food for chickens? Does it fix nitrogen in the soil? Is it a dynamic accumulator of some other useful trace elements or minerals? Can it tolerate juglone? That's the big topic for today. And then this last one is unique for me, but I do have multiple sclerosis. And so I note where I can any plant that's known to have beneficial properties for either brain health or for anti-inflammation. AI here is not artificial intelligence. And then the last section I'm not really going to talk about today, but I do look at aesthetics as well. Is the plant fragrant? And then does it have, as an example, flowers or striking foliage or attractive berries? And if so, what season does that occur in? For any guild, I need to make sure that it will be hardy in my climate. That means removing anything that's not at least zone six. Ideally, I kind of want zone five, to be honest, but I'll include six for now. And in this case, I need to filter for only the elements that have a Y, meaning yes, this is juglone tolerant. You can see this is a much shorter list of plants. If I start with just the overstory trees and eliminate everything else for now, I'm down to four options. I can either have, from an edible perspective, something that gives me a crop, a black walnut or a pecan tree. I've got a note over here that says plant two, and that is because both of these plants will only produce a full crop if they get cross-pollination. They can pollinate themselves, but it's not nearly as good of a yield. The trick is that they're big. So both of these are you know, somewhere around, call it 60 feet in diameter. The reason that I'm concerned about this will be kind of evident here. If you look at the north half of our site, that's this image. I recently did a video about our zone three orchard and long season crops that are going in the northwest corner. And today I'm focusing over here. I'm gonna need a noise controlling berm along the northern edge of the property to help block noise from the street. 
And really what's left as far as placing a walnut guild or pecan guild is right down here. Both pecan and walnut have roughly that 60 foot spread and I've drawn that into scale here. You can see there's really only room for one of these trees. And since both of them need cross pollination, that's not really gonna work. Zooming in to show the area, there is one potential approach I've seen and I think I'm gonna give it a shot, might be crazy. And that is to plant four trees in a close cluster and then prune them as they grow initially, at least, as if it is one tree. And my thought here is if I do two pecans at a diagonal to one another and two walnut trees at a diagonal to each other, this gives me hopefully um, some insurance in two regards. One, if it turns out that the pecan tree is not cold hardy enough, I can still get the walnut. And two, putting in Two trees close to one another should give me that cross pollination that I need in order to get a good crop. I can then move along to our shrubs and understory trees, our next layer is down. And looking at this, there's one more thing now to factor in, which is that if my experiment works and the plants grow and the walnut and pecan eventually reach their full size, you're gonna get a bit of shade in this area. Not a ton, especially initially, it's gonna get really nice sun, but over time it will reduce the light. For that reason, I'm going to remove anything that needs full sun because those plants really won't make it long term. That leaves me with the list of plants shown here. My next consideration is just which of these do I want? I've got a few considerations. This is next to our driveway and therefore visible, and the north side of it is also visible from the street. So from the driveway, I'd like something pretty. I'm gonna say flowering dogwood and forsythia. From the north, I'd really like something that gives a bit of a privacy barrier. And of these, wild plum has kind of a growth habit that looks like a thicket of plants. And that should give a nice shield from the north. The other element I want to factor in is nitrogen fixing. Of all of these plants, there's only one that does that, and that's gumiberry. I'm gonna go ahead and select that one as well. Let's place those understory shrubs. As mentioned, the wild plum drawn to scale here should go along the northern edge. This gives me a bit of visual privacy and maybe some sound protection from the north. I'm then going to put the dogwood and both of the forsythia bushes here lining the driveway just for aesthetic reasons. I'm then going to place the gumi bushes. These really are meant to provide nitrogen into this guild and I want to disperse them around a bit to help spread that nitrogen through the soil. I put them around the walnut and pecan because that is the element I care most about, but I also am trying to place them in such a way that they won't get double shade. And you kind of see from the dashed lines here, these should be under the canopy of the central walnut and pecan, but not shaded out by the wild plum or the dogwood. Even after placing the dogwood, forsythia, gumiberry, and plum, I still had some room left in that guild. And I'm going to see what else I can tuck in here uh, just for variety. Let's just do edible plants and see where that leaves us. I did put hazelnut in my zone three planting, but because this is kind of an experiment with the pecan and the walnut, and I'm not totally sure they're going to work, it might be nice to have a backup plan. Hazelnut would give me another nut crop. I'll put one of those in, maybe two. And then Juneberry is another one. This I've never eaten. I don't know if I'm gonna like it or not, but it does also provide some wildlife forage, kind of worst case. And right now the guilds skewed pretty hard towards summer things. Juneberry comes into crop late summer, early fall, and that should help round out the availability of food for the birds until the hazelnut and the dogwood berries come in in kind of the fall and winter. Let me place those in this guild. They are going to go in the southeast corner of this guild. Let me show their placement. I am still trying to avoid a double shade. I've put the hazelnuts sort of out at the edge of this and the June berry tucked in just a little. This should hopefully give them enough sun. And then looking at this, I decided to add one more gumi berry bush at the edge here because the hazel and the June berry are both going to be pulling nitrogen out of the soil. Adding a little bit more in just kind of felt like a good idea. Moving on to the ground cover and the kind of herbaceous layer, my, my low ones, a couple of gaps I want to fill here. 
there really isn't a lot of happening for our insect friends in this guild right now. Not a lot of nectar or pollen. I'd like to round that out. The other thing I want to look at is whether I can grow anything that gives me some beneficial teas that I can use for brain health or anti-inflammation. And a couple things I'm going to relax. The first is I don't mind if these are annuals. And the reason for that is I tend to start pollinator plants every year as annuals that I put in the mix in my vegetable garden to help provide pollination for those crops. It's really easy for me to just start a few extra and tuck them into this guild. So let me change that, relax it, and I'm going to put in ground cover and herbaceous and remove the shrubs from this. And they don't need to be edible, so let me bring that back as well. And what we're left with is kind of this mix here. You can see lots and lots of insectary plants in the mix. If I filter this down to only those that also give me some brain benefits, I've got bee balm, holy basil, and lemon balm. Looking at this guild, there are two areas left where I could place the bee balm and the holy basil, shown that as these pink blobs. And then the lemon balm, which is noted here, that's just going to be a ground cover throughout. And when I have walked around on the site, I'll try and show some imagery here, one of the ground covers that's really common here already is Corsican mint. It's growing quite well. It's taking over anywhere where it gets sufficient light and it is juggalone tolerant. Lemon balm is also in the mint family. And if Corsican mint is doing well here, lemon balm should as well. I'm going to try and start some cuttings of lemon balm and sprinkle them throughout this area and see if we can get them to take hold. This is not something that's going to be done in a day and the sequencing and phasing of how I'm going to reclaim this area and install this guild is a whole other topic. I'll do a different video on that when we get to that part of the project. In the meantime, I hope it was helpful to at least see the logic of how I worked this through and did this layout. If you have any questions or comments and if you've tried this yourself, I would very much love to hear from you. Just throw comments down below. You can probably tell from the audio, even in this video, that I do need a sound barrier berm up on the north side of the property. That will be covered in probably our next video. Until then, hope that was helpful. Thanks.